This video is the second part of the respiratory system. In the previous part, we covered nose, sinuses, pharynx, larynx, epiglottis, trachea. Now let's cover the rest of the respiratory system. So when you inhale, the air enters the nose, goes into the larynx, pharynx, the windpipe, that's your trachea and the bronchi. Now let's understand the bronchi. Now the bronchi are the airways that lead from the trachea into the lungs and then branch off into smaller structures known as primary bronchus, secondary bronchus and then bronchioles until they reach the alveoli. The tiny sacs that allows for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lungs. Bronchioles. Now, bronchioles are air passages inside the lungs that branch off like tree limbs from the bronchi. The bronchioles are the part of the lower respiratory system. As they branch off from the bronchi, they become smaller and smaller, transversing the interior of each lung before ending at clusters of alveoli. The bronchioles deliver air to tiny sacs called alveoli, where oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. They are vulnerable to conditions like asthma, uh, bronchitis, cystic fibrosis and emphysema that can cause constriction and obstruction of the airways. Now let's talk about the alveoli. The alveoli are an important part of the respiratory system whose function is to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules to and from the bloodstream. These tiny balloon-shaped air sacs sit at the very end of the respiratory tree and are arranged in clusters throughout the lungs. Alveoli are tiny balloon-shaped structures and are the smallest passageway in the respiratory system. The alveoli are very thin, allowing the relatively easy passage of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the alveoli and blood vessels called capillaries. Lung diseases affecting your alveoli include pneumonia, an infection of your alveoli usually by bacteria or viruses including the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. Alveoli are the end point of the respiratory system which starts when you inhale into the mouth or nose. The oxygen rich air travels down the trachea and then into of the two lungs via the right or the left bronchus. From there, the air is directed through smaller and smaller passages called bronchioles past the alveoli duct until it finally enters into alveolus. Now let's talk about the capillaries. Blood vessels in the alveoli walls that move oxygen and carbon dioxide. The alveoli are surrounded by tiny blood vessels called capillaries. The alveoli and capillaries both have very thin walls which allow the oxygen to pass from the alveoli to the blood. The capillaries then connect to the larger blood vessels called veins which bring oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart. Some of the other components of your respiratory system include your lungs, your lungs are in your chest and are so big that they can take up most of the space in there. You have two lungs but they aren't the same size, the way your eyes or nostrils are. Instead, the lungs on the left side of your body is a bit smaller than the lungs on the right. This extra space on the left leaves room for your heart. 
you can't see your lungs, but it is easy to feel them in action. Put your hands on your chest and breathe in very deeply. You will find your chest getting slightly bigger. Now breathe out the air and feel your chest returning to its regular size. You have just felt the power of your lungs. Muscles and bone help move the air you inhale into and out of your lungs. Some of the bones and muscles in the respiratory system include your diaphragm. Beneath the lungs is the diaphragm, a dome-shaped muscle that works with your lungs to allow you to inhale, that is breathe in, and exhale, that is breathe out. Muscles that help your lungs pull in air and push it out. The diaphragm and the intercostals. The major muscle of respiration is the diaphragm. This large flat muscle is shaped somewhat like a full parachute or a dome. It fills the entire inner circumference below the lungs and heart, attaching to the rib cage and the lumbar spine. It serves to divide the vital organs resting above it from the digestive organs that reside below it. The diaphragm motion is similar to that of a piston, just as the lungs are similar to a combustion chamber. When the diaphragm contracts, it moves down, pulling the air in while you're inhaling motion. Its contraction transforms its shape from a lofty dome to something rather like a frisbee saucer that has widened it downwards motion. During normal breathing, the motion is rather shallow. Hence, air does not enter the lungs, larger lower region. With a full inhalation, air reaches into your lower lungs, where there is more space to receive the full capacity of respiration. The blood supply to the lower lobes is gravity dependent. So when we are upright, there is far more blood available for oxygen exchange in the lower parts of the lungs. It is for this reason that diaphragmatic breathing which draws air into those lower regions is such an essential component of optimal exercise breathing. Now let's talk about the ribs. Bones that surround and protect your lungs and heart. Your lungs are protected by the rib cage, which is made up of 12 sets of ribs. These ribs are connected to your spine in your back and go around your lungs to keep them safe. The rib motions are caused by two set of muscles located between the ribs, the internal and external intercostal. These muscles open and elevate the ribs to expand the circumference and increase the internal cavity for the lungs during inhalation. The muscles contract in reverse during exhale. Whichever way one breathes, there is no difference in the amount of oxygen consumed by the body, but there is a vast difference in the amount of work required by the lungs and heart to accomplish the same amount of oxygenation. In fact, the workload of the cardiorespiratory system may be reduced by as much as 50% by changing from chest to diaphragmatic breathing. Now, this was a very important note given by Dr. Phil Nuremberger, PhD. It's a very good book. You should go through it. This can be seen by the number of breath one takes in one minute. While those who breathe through the chest will average about 16 to 20 breaths per minute. Those who breathe through the diaphragm will average only 6 to 8 breaths per minute. In a 24-hour period, chest breathers will take 22,000 to 25,000 breaths 
while diaphragmatic breathers will take only 10,000 to 12,000. This is a significant difference, friends. As we grow up, we develop poor and unhealthy breathing patterns, which replace natural breathing. And eventually, we don't utilize the diaphragm in our normal day-to-day -day resting breathing pattern. In fact, in many cases, the diaphragm gets frozen, showing little to absolutely no movement at all. There are a number of reasons why we develop poor breathing patterns. The psychological traumas we undergo as we grow up also contribute to the development of thoracic breathing. You can actually observe that fear tightens the stomach muscles, preventing diaphragmatic breathing. For example, if you watch children being scolded by their parents, they tighten their stomach muscles, forcing them to breathe through the chest. We all experience these small traumas as we grow up. And they have the effect on our breathing pattern. Poor postures also prevent diaphragmatic breathing and makes one rely completely on thoracic breathing. For these and many more reasons, we develop a habitual breathing pattern, which results in increased stress, anxiety, depression, and inefficient use of the cardiopulmonary system. Remember, friends, we have primary respiratory muscles and secondary respiratory muscles. Now, the primary inspiratory muscles are the diaphragm and external intercostal. Relaxed normal respiration is a passive process happens because of the elastic recoil of the lungs and surface tension. However, there are few muscles that help in forceful expiration and include the internal intercostals, intercostalis, intimi, subcostals and the abdominal muscles. The muscles of inspiration elevate the ribs and sternum and the muscles of expiration depress them. Now, the accessory inspiratory muscles are the sternocleidomastoid, the scalene anterior, medius and posterior, the pectoralis major and minor, the inferior fibers of serratus anterior and latissimus dorsi. The serratus posterior superior may help in inspiration also. The iliocostalis services Technically, any muscles attached to the upper limbs and the thoracic cage can act as an accessory muscles of inspiration through reverse muscle action. The accessory expiratory muscles are the abdominal muscles, rectus abdominis, external obliques, internal obliques, and transverse abdominis. Friends, I really hope that you enjoyed it and please feel free to send any questions that you may have. Take care, keep smiling, Namaste.